Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for continuing to talk and talk and talk. So I had to sit there and see my face up on the screen the whole time. Uh, Eric, do we have a clicker, by the way, for... All right, perfect. Perfect. All right, let's see if we can get this figured out real quick. What's that? Which one is... We should have done this beforehand, huh? All right, that sounds good. I'll just tell you when to click over. All right, so uh, my name is Brandon Walker. I am the VP of Sales for Untapped down in Wilmington. Uh, we came up last night. Uh, you can go ahead. Yep, Untapped, in case you are unfamiliar, is the Facebook for beer. Um, we launched back in 2011 100% as a social media platform with really no intent to monetize. The plan was people would go, they would check in beers, leave reviews, add photos, um, and over time, we actually started getting a followership. As you guys know, being here in Raleigh, Durham, craft beer is sort of a thing now. Uh, and so as that grew, we grew, and um, a lot of businesses started to pay attention and want to leverage that community. So back in February of 2016, we launched Untapped for Business. Uh, that was the sexiest name we could come up with at the time. Um, and so Untapped for Business is basically a, uh, it's a SaaS service that allows bars, breweries, restaurants, liquor stores to go leverage our platform, uh, better market their product, their events, um, and collect some of our data and analytics to help them make smarter buying decisions. And so since February of 2016, we've grown to a little bit of over 14,000 paying business customers, so in about two years. Uh, our sales team has grown to 50 people. As a collective, we've onboarded uh, about 100 people in total going through our sales program. Um, we were named, as I mentioned on the bio, number 259 to the Inc. 5000 list, and we expect to be on there again this year. Uh, and we were named number 98 on the Entrepreneur 360 list of the most entrepreneurial companies in the country as well. Um, and again, we are all based in just Wilmington, North Carolina. So this morning, you can go ahead and tab over, Eric. This morning, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, my journey and our team's journey in growing from zero to 50 salespeople in two years um, with a brand new product and one product. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the recruiting, um, the training, and the motivation that goes into keeping a team continue to churn at a high level for uh, long periods of time. So real quick, raise of hands, how many of you have teams right now or are planning on starting teams for your company or your sales program sometime in the next 12 months? Hell yes. All right, awesome, awesome. So this is super pertinent. First things first with recruiting, check yourself before you wreck yourself. We almost made this mistake super early on is your goal is going to be we have a product, we know who we want to sell to, so let's just go ahead and burn it up. Let's go, let's start hiring people, let's, let's raise some capital and drive some revenue through this thing. Uh, go ahead and tab over please, Eric. Now, unfortunately, uh, if you make that error, you are going to break down really fast. You need to not only understand who you're selling to, but you have to have some tenet, some facet for how you are going to be selling your product. So you as sales leaders, it's not your responsibility to hire in somebody to develop your entire sales program and to then figure out uh, you know, the objection handling and the scripting and the closing and the onboarding. It is your responsibility to own all of that. And so once you understand that, that is when you begin to recruit people into the program because they're going to have something to grow on top of. Now, if you're a CEO, it's different. You may be hiring a VP of sales or a director of sales to put that together. But all in all, you have to have some facet of leadership in your organization to begin scaling. Recruiting, we're going to focus a little bit today in each of these three tenants on the three things that I think are most important about recruiting, about training, and about motivating. I spent so much time putting together this massive, robust deck that I totally scrapped that I'm gonna share out with you guys that is a little bit more content-oriented um, because I think there are so many layers you could dive into. My girlfriend and I have a joke about things that could, should this be a blog or should this be a book? Should this be a blog post or should this be a book? And I wrote the damn book on the deck yesterday and went in and turned it into a blog post. So first things first from recruiting. Early on, Either you're a small business or you're a fast growth uh, startup. 
right? I think that's the case. Or you're an organization like a Pendo, like an IBM, and you have time or you have money. You have limited resources. At the end of the day, you're going to have to expend one or both to actually do this the right way. There's no way for you to grow to get the right people in the door without expending some sort of capital, social, energy, or monetary. So be ready to invest that. As you begin hiring, as your ads are out in the market, as you're starting to build a network and you're getting to know people, we're salespeople, right? Like, I'm going to want to be like, you should come work at Untapped. You're going to get paid more than anywhere else, and you're going to learn so much about yourself, and you're going to go cross the valley and end up on the other side. What happens is you start selling your position, you bring people in that have no, no place in being a salesperson. And that's no slight on the individual. That's to say that what we do takes a really unique skill set and a lot of people don't fall into that, right? So you're not doing yourself a service by going out and trying to sell your position. You should be brutally honest about what it's gonna entail, what the grind is gonna look like, what they're gonna go through, you can still paint the vision a little bit, right? Tell them about what the opportunity is. Oh God, did I mess that up? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go into training. And finally, you're gonna see this as a common thread throughout. You need to be collecting data. Uh, you need to know the potential employee as well as you can. So this means during your interview process, we start off, we have a resume, an application, and a cover letter that gets reviewed. Then we move people on to a phone interview. That's hearing things like tonality, how curious are they, what kind of questions do they ask, have they done their research, how do they answer questions, you know, the standard stuff. If that goes well, we put them through a proprietary personality assessment. We have an archetype sort of developed for what is a good salesperson, and we've gotten bitten in the ass a few times on that one. Put them through that, just one more proxy. And then finally, they go through an in-person interview with myself, a hiring manager, a sales manager, and one of our senior reps on the floor. And we all come together and say, so what do we think? Sort of a litmus test, right? All right, um, you please go on. Okay, cool. So recruiting, we finally have good people. We have a good system to build on. Now you have to train them. Don't put the cart before the horse. Not only do you need to know how you're selling, what you're selling, all the stuff we just talked about, but you need to know how you're gonna train people you could hire the best salesperson in the world to come in, and if they don't know your product or your CRM or your market or your preferences, they could be really good at objection handling and closing questions and all that stuff. That's only one piece of the puzzle, right, Eric? So in training, your managers, if you are a big company or as you start to develop layers of leadership within your organization, don't know how to train off the bat. Coaching current reps is very, very different from teaching skills to new reps, all right? That was an error, that was a huge mistake that I made early on. I expected just to be able to hand it off. You guys do this every day. But there's a big difference between somebody who knows how to do objection handling and making sure that they're doing it, you know, feel, felt, found. And there's a big difference between that and actually teaching somebody what that means. Because you don't just say the words feel, felt, found, and it works, right? So you have to invest the time and energy in managing your managers, training your managers to train the reps so you can actually scale your team. Otherwise, every time you wanna hire a new group, you're gonna be the one driving the training and it bottlenecks your entire system. It's unscalable, right? So you're gonna see a common thread here with collecting data and with investing the time and the energy. Um, as I said in the bio, the key takeaway here for this entire presentation is if you don't invest in your managers, if you don't invest in the reps coming through the door, if you don't invest in the system and you continue to go through the day in and day out and just let it be status quo, eventually uh, it will start breaking down on you. Now, training is not just five days and done. Uh, we did that for a long time and it didn't work out for us. What we ended up doing was we developed a boot camp system. And what that means is it is a three month program after your original five day classroom training where reps go through uh, three evaluation periods with increasing metrics, increasing expectations, some of which are bound by activity, such as phone calls and emails, things they have total control over. And some of them are the outcomes that we want them to achieve, appointments scheduled, appointments held, things of that nature, right? So what you do is you give yourself license and liberty to have structured coaching and training throughout that three months, and you have these evaluation periods at the end of each month where you can hold somebody accountable and say, why didn't you make those phone calls? Why didn't you send those emails? 
And if they go through it, they receive the coaching and they hit all the targets, pay them. Give them a bonus. That's fantastic. There's a threshold that they can meet that maybe they don't earn a bonus, but they move on to the next stage, or you let them go because you can make a decision with diluted metrics that this may not be a great fit early, right? Hire slow, fire fast. Have you guys heard that expression before? All right, great. And again, collect the data. Why and when is your attrition occurring? We have three numbers that we know, 81%, 63%, 55%. 81% of the reps that I hire are here after three months. 63% are here after six months. And 55% are here after a year. Okay, seems arbitrary, right? We're in sales. Attrition is normal. You want to keep things fresh, keep things moving. It's okay to have attrition. What is not okay is to not understand why it's happening and when it's happening in the system. And shame on us. It took us 18 months to start measuring that. 18 months for me to understand that we could do a better job recruiting. We're not looking in the right places. We're spending too much money. We're selling ourselves. Our training system sucks. And so once you realize that, you understand those numbers, now you have a baseline to start tracking and seeing improvements in your own processes, your own systems. Go ahead, sorry, yeah. All right, entropy. This is one of my favorite words. Entropy, it's like a law of thermodynamics that I don't understand. But what I do know is entropy refers to in, in an, an enclosed environment in a, in a state of consistency and normalcy, things will start to fall into disorder. Things will naturally decay over time and what once was steadfast and strong begins to deteriorate and pull apart. Okay, that is extremely, extremely true in regards to a team. Right? If, if your team comes in and every day they're focusing on my day-to-day -day metrics, how many appointments did I schedule, how many did I hold, and how many wins did I have, how many sales did I make, how much revenue did I generate, people start to lose focus on the higher picture, and you have to work to parse it all back together, pull everybody back to the core, instead of uh, having people at the core and just driving it forward in the first place. Go ahead, Eric. All right. So how do you keep people motivated? We've been selling the same product for two years. Fortunately, we're going to start launching new business products at the end of this year. Woo, go untapped. Uh, but we haven't. We've had salespeople giving the same demos for two years that last 25 minutes at a time. Of course, they're going to get a little bit tired of it. They're salespeople. They're ambitious. They're aggressive. You know, you can feel a little bit stagnated. Your culture is king. What we invested in going into this year is creating a culture manifesto for our sales team. And it's a, it's a statement of tenants that embody the ideal employee that we could have people align with. Uh, things like, you know, execute the play that is called, or trust the leadership, trust the process, trust the teammates, or communicate with the right people at the right time about the right topics. Um, when you fail, bounce back. You know, things that you guys hear and know all the time, but people have a really tough time articulating and embodying on a normal basis. What putting that together allows you to do is hold people accountable to these subjective tenets and push them to be that ideal employee. We're never going to be there, but we can fight for it, right? That helps people stay focused on what's bigger than them. People love transparency. Um, some sales leaders and leaders of businesses try to keep everything close to the chest and not pull their team into the conversation. What you'll find is to whatever degree you're able to provide context and transparency to your subordinates, do it. Because it helps them keep an eye on the bigger picture. They remember the why they're here in the first place. Untapped is changing a damn industry. We're, we're totally taking over the, uh, the three-tier system in the beer space. And when people remember that, they're like, wow, this is really cool. This is really cool what we have going on right now. And finally, as you scale, you'll find that tribes and subcultures drive camaraderie amongst your team. Think about it. Uh, you have in the NFL, the NBA, you have teams of five, teams of 11 that go out. You have your offense. You have your defense. And each of those have their own coaches, their own managers. And everybody ties together in smaller cliques and units. What we did was we have one manager per 12 or less reps on our team. And what that allows us to do is the managers can create their own messaging, their own context, their own themes within the confines of the uh, culture manifesto that we have. And so their teams align with their managers. It's like their own head coach running the system. 
That empowers middle management, leadership, to have their own say in things, deliver their message the way they want to, and it keeps people adhered to a system that's smaller than me and 50 reps. All right, go ahead. All right, so today, walking away, the two things I want you guys to remember, if I haven't said it enough, we're going to say it one more time. Collect data on everything that you can. Everything that's measurable, measure it, test it, iterate on it, go back, try it again, because your first assumptions are going to be wrong every single time. And secondly, invest. It's really easy to, to be introspective and to keep focusing on ourselves and what we can do to grow. You have to take the time and energy to train the people under you to be able to do the same job that you do in training, in selling, or else a system will deteriorate. Because at the end of the day, you're one person, and one person can't scale into 50 without you investing a ton of time and energy into that. So, unfortunately, I have to leave here. I have a flight out, so I'm not going to be able to mingle and hang out. Uh, that is my email address and my Twitter handle. Please feel free to reach out. i um, happy to answer any questions and help out with whatever I can. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Want to stay up there? Can you have 10 more minutes? What's that? You have 10 more minutes? Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, I guess we can do Q&A. I still have some time up here. So, if, if anybody has any questions, If anyone needs that. a mic, let me know. I, it's not that big of a... Place. And I have a big mouth. I probably don't need this either. Um, okay. Um, okay, so how much can you share? I, I think that, so there are companies, I can't remember what the model's called, that they, uh, have you heard of Buffer? It's like Hootsuite, one of those social media, like, scheduling things. They share every single one of their company's KPIs, revenue numbers, attrition rates, churn, everything. Like, they tweet it out, send it to public. They're a private company. They don't have to do that. That may be excessive. Like, it depends on what kind of business you run. But in my opinion, things were a SaaS company. So things like annual recurring revenue, you have these big milestones at $10 million in ARR, $100 million in ARR. And if you get the team really focused on that and you're pushing for that number, that's huge. Uh, new products that are coming down the pipeline, um, new orientations for the sales team. What it does is it's really easy for people to get bogged down in what my life is today and what I'm experiencing right now and forget about the holistic stuff. Nobody will ever be as excited as the founders. And then below the founders are the executives and the VPs and the people who get that bigger picture. Think about it. As you go down the hierarchy, people are less and less engaged with their role day to day in general. So if you can give them, empower them a little bit more to have a little bit of the same exposure that you have at the top, that gives them more of that buy-in and has them, what are you doing here on a Saturday? Oh, well, you said we need you know, another $20,000 this month to get to that number. I just want to do my part. When you see that happen, I'd say that's a good balance to strike. Others? I got a question for you. You were, I appreciate the fact that you said you made some mistakes and you learned from those mistakes. I'm curious, one of the things you've tried that you were surprised was a huge success. Were there any ones that are like, wow, I didn't think that was going to work? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. So, Chandler, do you have any good ideas? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most of the time, it's like a guess and check sort of a system. So the way that we run it, we're really lean. We haven't raised a lot of money as a company at all. Uh, we've taken on debt financing as opposed to equity financing. So we try to run our operation as lean as possible. And so what that means, it wasn't until two months ago that I had a sales operations person that's able to tell me what my attrition looks like and all of those things. Uh, I would say that that's one that I expected to really add value, focusing on, like, we just spent a bunch of money on Facebook ads and Google ads to drive inbound leads, and we're like, let's just run that for a year and a half. That's not a good idea. So, so we finally got somebody involved in those processes, and that has been, like, enlightening for me to see granular data that I was totally, totally missing. So, uh, other, about hiring, since you hired so many reps, you must know now the characteristics that you cannot live without? Like, is there two or three characteristics that this person doesn't have? That is an out? awesome question. Yeah, so two things on, uh, I'm gonna share with you guys my favorite interview question, uh, but first I'll answer that one. I should probably say that, because it's awesome. Okay, so uh, three characteristics that we look for. Coachability. 
Coachability is massive. You can hire somebody for skill or somebody for their personality. I tend to err on the side of personality. It's not foolproof to hire a really good salesperson. Um, so what that means is coachability. Are they receptive? Do they want to learn? Do they ask a lot of questions? So on and so forth. Uh, resilience. The, my favorite interview question gets people shook. It gets them rattled. So what happens is you want to see how they bounce back from that. Do they really freak out and say, can we move on to the next question? Or do they sit there, ask you for help, and try to break down the problem? And then finally is just overall communication skills and curiosity. They're going to be, in our case, on the phones all the time. In your case, maybe going out, being face-to-face, -face, whatever that looks like. They need to be able to communicate well, hold themselves articulately, and even under times of pressure or constraint, be able to you know, get the stuff off their head in a conversational way. Um, so those are the three tenets. As far as my favorite interview question, I'll build it up a little bit. It's during the in-person interview. I started off. They've never talked to me before. We give them the tour of the office. They sit down in a conference room. I like give them a cup of water. If they don't have a paper and a pen, like slide that over. Like, all right, cool. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, okay? You have a hammer and a nail. They're like, what the hell? <laughs> Like cumulatively, the hammer and the nail cost one dollar and ten cents. The hammer costs exactly one dollar more than the nail costs. Understanding both those criteria to be true, how much do the hammer and the nail cost independently of one another? And I just like. And so you just take a seat back, and they're like, "Wait, what? Like, totally didn't expect that question to come in a sales interview." So really, the answer, we can play the game of what is it, but the answer is $1.05 and five cents. I bet most of you guys were thinking $1.10, and you're like, no, that's a 90 cent difference, not a $1 difference. But then people start getting like really sweaty and uncomfortable. So when that happens, what is that? It's a sale where you're getting pressure, right? Like you, we've been in that situation before. They ask a question you don't expect. They're not biting on the piece of data you thought they would bite on. So then I just sit there and I just like grin. Like no matter how well, how poorly it's going, and so you just help them work through the problem. If they ask questions, you get there. Um, but that's really indicative, not whether or not they get the question right the first time, but how they process it and break it down after the fact shows you a lot about them. So feel free to take that one home with you. That's awesome. Give it up to Brandon.